this is something called Tor or another dark web um, browser. And Tor stands for the onion router. And it was actually developed as US military software and now is used for free online. And you can download it anytime you want. There's Tor servers that you can get on your iPhone. There's Tor stuff that you can get online um, and put up on your PC. But it is, the dark web is to some degree why Bitcoin still exists. And we'll talk about that in a couple of pages. Number three, and I'm getting this a lot from journalists in the last couple of weeks, why doesn't this thing just die? There's obviously been a ton of bad news. So let's talk about that. This is a one-year chart of Bitcoin prices. And you see that little squiggle in April 2013? That was the first near-death experience. And that was simply that Bitcoin got really popular really fast. It went from 30, 40, 50, all the way up to... Um, about $200, and then it collapsed because this was the, still maybe the first Mt. Gox problem. Gox had to shut down for four days because it was getting so many applications for new accounts that it couldn't keep up. And that began to ding people's confidence. And basically, Bitcoin then went through its kind of period in the wilderness, as you can see from the chart afterward. And it basically began to rally when China started accepting Bitcoin, and that was in the latter part of last year. China is obviously a very good market for Bitcoin for a number of reasons. Because of all the things we talked about in terms of structure, Bitcoin is largely anonymous. And if you can get money from a bank account into a Bitcoin exchange, when you own those letters and numbers and you own the private key, you can literally take that money, and as long as it's money good, walk into any other country anywhere around the world, open a bank account, and as long as you can get through the banking system in that country, you can hook up to an exchange and the money will get wired to you. It is just like the old school 1950s Swiss bank accounts that you see in old Cary Grant movies where the person walks into the Swiss bank with his numbers, hands it over to a teller and is heralded into a room and an investment banker comes in and says, oh, Mr. Smith, how are you today? And obviously his name is not Smith, but you can get the sense of that level of confidentiality. A very, very ideal for people worried about asset confiscation around the world. And we'll see in a couple of pages that that actually still resonates. Um, then you had the second blow up. And let me tell you something, and I'm sure Mr. Bitcoin here will corroborate this. The Bitcoin world is very tight, very small, talks a lot. And remember that Bitcoin right now, the closest thing it is is a currency. There's no such thing as insider trading in a currency. Currencies are not securities. Very important thing to keep in mind as we think about regulation. People knew about Gox and the problem Gox was having months and months ahead of time. Am I right? Yeah. People understood that Gox was problematic at best and a real challenge at worst. They knew something was wrong, and they were basically were waiting for it to blow up. So keep in mind as you think about Bitcoin is there's a group of now probably a couple of hundred people that talk all the time, and there is a lot of information being transferred about whose projects are working and whose projects aren't. So if you're interested in trading this and you're actually here because you think you can trade Bitcoin, get yourself inside that information flow. It's not all that hard. Bitcoin people are pretty open and friendly. They want to talk, but you got to get into that flow if you want to understand what's going on in the currency day to day and week to week. Because what happened at Gox wasn't a big surprise. Uh, but nonetheless, you've had basically this churning pattern. For those of you who are technically oriented, I'll bet that you see a flag formation sometime between December of last year and now with that big hump and then a lower high and then basically a baseline around roughly $500 a share. There are a lot of ex-Wall Street traders that trade Bitcoin and they trade it just like they do any other security, any other asset class. So if you're looking at technical patterns, chances are pretty good that a lot of the other folks looking at trading are also looking at the same technical patterns. The thing that I'll tell you, I mean, you know I spent three years at SAC, so you understand my bias as a trader as well as an analyst. I respect price intensely in a capital market, and price tells me the truth. And what I would tell you is there are many people that look at Bitcoin and say, oh, it should die. Why is it still around? Why are we wasting our time with this? And all I usually tell them is at the end of the day, you have to respect price. Look at this chart and internalize it. Because this tells you that there is organic demand for this product and it's not going away. If Bitcoin, by all rights, by all the headlines that we've had in the past couple of weeks, it should be dead. It should be 50 bucks with nobody talking about it. It should blow up like a small cap stock where the CEO runs out one day. And it hasn't done that. So no matter how you think about it, no matter what your biases are, respect price. Because otherwise, as you all know very well, you get run over.